Welcome to the Craft to Career Podcast with Elizabeth Chapel, where every week we dive into how you can turn your craft into a successful career. Get ready to have the career you've always dreamed of. Hello, and welcome to episode 53 of the Craft to Career Podcast. I have a guest this week that I'm really excited I had. She's talking about Etsy. If you're not aware, right now there's this petition for Etsy sellers to put their stores on vacation mode and take a stand because Etsy's raising their prices. I I just, I've heard a lot of negative things about Etsy. And so when someone reached out and said, hey, I'd love to share about Etsy and how to use it to grow your business, I was like, you know, let's do this because I'm very curious about this. And I'm not going to lie, after listening to Lauren and chatting with her, my views on Etsy have changed. And Lauren even just posted on Instagram her thoughts about this strike from makers. So not everyone will agree. However, I do think it's worth listening and learning from Lauren and seeing if Etsy is the right fit for your business. Just like everything else on this podcast, I'm not presenting things as if You have to do this. This is the only way to do this. But I like to present all the different sides of business so that you can find what works for you and what's right for you. And you might just find that selling on Etsy is a great fit for you. So before I introduce you to Lauren, I want to read this week's review, which comes from Becca Plymail Creative. And she is actually responding to last week's episode about working with an illness. I will say I had quite a few people reach out that really resonated with you listeners. If you didn't listen to last week's episode 52, Working with an Illness, and that's something that you struggle with, I invite you to go back and listen. I think you'll really find something meaningful there. Becca says, love this podcast. I always love, love, love the Craft to Career podcast, but today's episode hits so close to home. This episode was full of such wonderful advice for someone struggling with an autoimmune disease who wants to continue to advance their business. Thank you for continuing to bring such insightful takeaways. Becca, thank you so much for this review, and thank you for listening, and I just encourage you to hang in there. You're definitely not alone. There are so many people who are silently struggling with things, whether it's health, you know, mental, physical, life circumstances. And it's really nice to just know that you're not alone and that you can have success and move forward. It might look a little different than other people, but we can make our lives look wonderful, even with challenges or setbacks. So thank you so much, Becca, for that review. And now let's dive in and let me introduce you to Lauren Keplinger. Welcome, Lauren, to the Craft a Career podcast. I'm really excited to have you here. Um, for our listeners, can you just introduce yourself and tell us what you do? Yeah. Um, my name is Lauren Keplinger, and I started um, selling monogrammed baby gifts on Etsy uh, about t- almost 10 years ago at this point, which is crazy. Um, so 2012, I started my Etsy shop, and um, then in 2018, I started to also like coach and teach other people how to grow their Etsy shops um, to a meaningful income. Okay, cool. So monogram things. So <laughs> I, I'm a quilter here. Tell me, how did you get started with that? What what machine do you use? <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, my husband was in the military when I started my shop and I was like a little lost Um career wise. Well, I didn't really have a career, but, uh, life wise. (laughs) Um, and we were moving all of the time. So I really wanted something, a business that I could take with me when we were moving all the time. We never stayed anywhere longer. The longest, um, duty station we had was two years. Um, and my sister-in-law at the time had an Etsy shop and she was making applique, um, kids shirts, like birthday shirts. Um, and so she really helped me out a lot, um, getting started and learning. I did not know how to embroider, applique. I didn't know how to do anything. Um, and so I bought a brother 770 
And yeah, so my sister-in-law helped me learn the ropes and I bought the machine from, you know, an embroidery machine shop that they kind of sort of walked me through it. And then I learned by trial by fire, (laughs) teaching myself. Yeah, I love it. I absolutely love it. That scrappy by your bootstraps. I'm going to do this. So in a nutshell, how did you learn to navigate Etsy and, and what did your success look like? Like, what did that journey look like for you to, from starting off to like, okay, this is actually pretty lucrative. Yeah. So it was not that fast. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So I got started just kind of like as a, you know, a side hustle type thing. And I had a one-year-old and I was six months pregnant at the time. Um, and my husband was getting ready to go to Afghanistan. And so I really took that opportunity that he was gone and sort of, I guess, to keep my mind off him being gone or to occupy myself, um, in the evenings, my kids would go to bed at like six o'clock. So I had all these evenings by myself doing nothing and I would sew and I would take pictures and I was, this just kind of kept me having something other than just like these two, you know babies that, well, by the time he deployed, I had, had, had the baby that I was pregnant with. So I had like a 17 month old and a two month old. Um, yeah, they're really close. (laughs) Um, (laughs) so yeah, so this just like gave me something to do and to fiddle around with. And at the time, it's funny now looking back because at the time there was like no way really to connect with other Etsy sellers. Like the kind of social media that's out there now doesn't, didn't exist at the time, you know, like Facebook even was not really for connecting with people. It was just like, sort of like what LinkedIn is now. Um, and there was no like YouTube videos about how to embroider or anything like that. So I really just like jumped in and, and learned as I went. Um, but for me in getting started, my, I didn't really, I don't know that I really had goals at the time. Honestly, I just kind of like was taking it as I went. Um, and then as I got more consistent sales, um, those goals kind of changed with the seasons of my life. But my starting goal was when he got back from Afghanistan, we had one day a week date night. So we went out every Friday night and we were able to go to, we were living in Savannah, Georgia at the time. So we were able to go to like the fancier restaurants downtown and have a babysitter every Mm -hmm. Friday night. And my Etsy shop supplemented that. Like we really didn't have a lot of extra money at the time. I mean, he was in the military. And so, yeah, so that was huge for me. And then it grew well, it kind of like just treaded water for a little while. Um, and then eventually he made, Mm -hmm. he made the choice to get out of the military. And so I was like, I really think that I can build this business bigger. Like, I think there's a lot of untapped potential here that I'm not really taking advantage of. So he had a year of transitioning out of the military and he, he worked during the week and I worked all weekend, like eight or nine hours, Saturday and Sunday, um, sewing and doing new listings and on and on. And in that year of time, we were able to save up money, enough money for a down payment on a house when he got out of the military. And that was really kind of the shift for me, um, where I said, like, I I really think this could be more than what we've done so far. It was also obviously a huge shift in our family where we needed the money more because he was getting out of the military as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it was kind of the point where I said, like, I either kind of like need to do it or don't. And if I'm going to do it, I think I can do it well. Otherwise this is just like a really, you know, time consuming hobby. Um, so, but I mean, this, that was, Which, like, this is interesting. Yeah. It was like three or four years into my process. Yeah. So I feel, so sometimes people, I think approach it as, well, at least looking at me, you didn't need the income. You had that peace of mind that if it didn't work out, it would be okay. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how you approach it. If it's a necessity for your life, if it's, well, we don't need this, but it could work it can work regardless. And that you don't let that mindset get in the way that that actually worked. Was it terrifying though, to be like, well, this has got to work or, you know? Um, I mean, it was the whole kind of season of life was pretty scary. (laughs) Um, I mean, my Mm -hmm. husband is 
and I both actually are like super, super type A people. So to go from the military, which is like the most consistent paycheck that you could possibly have with benefits and everything that the military provides to jumping out of the military, which we, I mean, he was in ROTC in college when I met him. So like this was our whole adult lives up to this point had always been army life. Um, and so to then jump into something that was like completely up and down, I had this job that was up and down. He also took a job getting out of the army that was a uh, variable income. So it was like a lot of uncertainty. So yeah, the whole thing was pretty scary. <laughs> I'm glad we're not there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. So where did you guys go to college? Now I'm curious on a personal note. Um, we went to UNC Chapel Hill. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Okay. So are you still in North Carolina? We are now, now that he's out. Yeah. We moved back to my hometown when he got out. Okay. Fun. I've got a few friends out there. Very fun. So, all right. Diving into Etsy. Okay. <laughs> You've got a job to convince me that Etsy is a great place. So I'll, let me share my hesitations and I know they can't be just mine. Right. So Etsy takes a big percentage of sales. These are all things that I hear. I don't sell a ton on Etsy. I don't really even know if I have anything listed there. So I don't know. You're the expert here. So <laughs> enlighten me, but I hear that they take a large percentage of sales. Um, they start to charge for if they market for you, you don't own the audience, you know, like if you're not gathering email addresses, and it's, it's hard to direct people to your website. So if you have a landing page where they can learn about you or really connect with you. So those are my hesitations. And this is a really fun way to jump into introducing you. But, but these are the reservations that I hear about Etsy. So I'd love for you to speak to why Etsy? Why does someone want to sell on Etsy? And what, is it worth it? Yeah. So, um, Okay to the long and short of it is I, I do think it's worth it. <laughs> um, I think that there are, so this is a big, actually a big shift for myself that I have seen and also, um, sort of just shifted my own mindset around it within the past several years is that I used to say like, it's, fine to be just an Etsy business. Like that's the only platform that you sell on. That's the only place you sell. I still actually think that that's fine. Um, but I am seeing more and more people who don't just want to have an Etsy shop. They want other, um, avenues for revenue. So I think that it's important for people who maybe they're coming in and they're saying, but I don't know if Etsy is right for me to understand that it doesn't have to be Etsy or nothing. And it doesn't have to be, if you start an Etsy shop, then you're not doing anything else in your business to, you know, you're not, you don't have your own website or you're not doing anything else. Etsy can be an additional sales channel, even if you have, you know, an established business already. Um, and so, so yeah, so kind of approaching it from that point where you say like, even if you already have an established website, Etsy is just another way to get in front of another audience. Um, a lot of Etsy buyers are very loyal to Etsy. So you could look at that as, well, then it's hard to move them to my own website. Or you could look at it as they never would have bought on your own website anyway. They're loyal to Etsy. <laughs> so, you know, so. so Okay, not, this is convincing. <laughs> so not necessarily that <laughs> you're not going to be able to transfer them to your website. I would make the argument that there is a certain percentage of people that will translate to your own website and who will follow you to your own website. Um, but the buyers who are loyal to Etsy are going to buy on Etsy anyway. So if you're not on that platform, you're just missing out on those sales. They, they were already shopping on Etsy, which brings me to my next point, <laughs> which is that, yeah, I mean, Etsy does take a percentage of fees. They take 6.5%. They just raised their fees. Like as we speak, um, it went from five to six and a half percent, but in terms of the rest of the fees that you're paying on Etsy, like the, the bulk of the rest of the fees are credit card transaction fees, which you're going to pay anywhere. Um, so that part of it, the conversation is not as relevant, I think, as like the 6.5%, which is just an Etsy transaction fee. My, I guess, counter argument to that or my justification of that is for anybody that's ever run a website before, 
driving traffic is a huge, the hugest piece of it. If you don't have any traffic, you're not going to sell anything, obviously. Um, and so, you know, to have your own website, your own e-commerce site, Shopify or Squarespace or wherever you have that, you're going to have to have some mechanism of driving traffic. For some people, if you already have a huge Instagram following or whatever, you can drive that traffic organically. For a lot of people, the majority of people, I would say that traffic comes through paid ads. Um, and, and even if you don't have, you know, even if you have a mixture of those, there is still some sort of marketing effort. Even if you're working with Instagram influencers, you're paying for product or you're paying for sponsorships or whatever you're paying for. So there's always costs in involved in running a business, you know, in marketing your business. So when I look at my Etsy sales, I think, okay, well, I've paid, you know, whatever percentage it, it's gone up in the time that I have been selling on there, but, you know, 5%, 6.5% or whatever. And they have in turn brought me 23, almost 23,000 sales. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so would I have been able to drive 23,000 sales to my own website? Probably not. So I kind of look at the fees as the marketing budget for my my Etsy shop, you know, rather than spending, I would never tell you to run Facebook ads to your Etsy website because then you're like double dipping on your expenses. Um, True. but if you have any kind, you know, if you're paying for any kind of marketing, I would definitely drive that to your own website so that you're not having to pay the fees as well. But Etsy has such a, an enormous buyer base and so much built in traffic that if you're able to get your Etsy listings optimized to show up in the Etsy search, that can be a really great passive way of bringing in traffic to your Etsy shop where you're not paying those marketing expenses, in which case then the flip side of it is you pay those transaction fees. Yeah. Well, and it's kind of nice if you look at it from a marketing standpoint, if you pay for Facebook ads, you're paying no matter what, yeah. you might not get the sale. But with Etsy, right. you're only paying if you get the sale. Exactly. Uh, I mean, I'm sure, assuming you have to pay to be listed. Yeah, like you pay 20 cents to get something listed. So even if you compare that to, let's say, a Shopify site, you're paying $29 a month, you know, at minimum for a Shopify site or even like Squarespace or whatever, like you have to upgrade to the e-commerce platform or whatever. So a lot of places have like... I think that it is a, a misconception sometimes, particularly for people who are getting into it from a hobby mindset and they're not necessarily thinking about business expenses, but they get all worked up about Etsy fees. And, and in my mind, it's kind of like, there's always expenses with business. Like if you don't have profit margins that are going to cover some level of expense, like uh, you know, we pay to host these podcasts. We pay to host a website. Like there are just expenses with a business. And so you need to be able to price your products appropriately so that you can cover those expenses. And the 6.5% Etsy fees are just part of your expenses. And I think too, on that topic, to take away the fear of spending money because you really do have to spend money to make money. And I know that that's terrifying for people who are on a very tight budget or just starting out or all of the above, but to, to just lean into that, to accept it and to be smart about it. Don't go dumping money, you know, but you have got to spend money to earn money. And, and I do find that sometimes people get frustrated with that. They're like, wait, what? I have to pay for this and this and this. It's like, yeah, you do. You just do, you know? So yeah. that's a good, good way to reframe that. Yeah. I mean, there are just expenses and I think that, you know, I always kind of come at it as like, I wouldn't ask you to make your product for me for free. <laughs> so why would you expect that Etsy right. can host your product for free? Like they're a business too. So, <laughs> mm-hmm. And so you mentioned to get found on an Etsy listing. So I guess I just assumed if you put something into Etsy, it will show up when someone searches for it. Tell me more. Is this like SEO for Etsy or how does it work? Yes. Um, it, Etsy SEO is kind of a little bit different than some like more traditional SEO like Google or whatever. Um, it's kind of its own bird. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, back in the day, maybe, you know, if you got started on Etsy in like 2006, <laughs> you maybe could just put something up there and people would stumble on it and life was grand. 
Um, at this day and time, like this point in Etsy, like the number of buyers on Etsy has exploded. The number of sellers on Etsy has also grown a lot. So you have to be able to get your product in front of people and you're not going to have, you know, I don't have the only monogrammed baby blanket on Etsy. So there has to be a way to find my monogrammed baby blankets above and beyond everybody else's, or at least like along with everybody else's. Mm -hmm. So I, I know, but for our listeners, can you tell them you offer, you teach people how to, to be found on Etsy. Is that right? Yeah. So I really feel like Etsy SEO is kind of my secret sauce. Um, (laughs) There are a lot of when, especially when I got started teaching, there were a lot of people that would teach you like how to build, you know, write a blog and then direct people to your Etsy shop and stuff. To me, again, like I said before, I think that that doesn't really make sense. If I'm going to write a blog and, and figure out how to have a blog following, I'm going to direct them to my own website. So the traffic that I'm bringing to the equation, I'm going to direct them to a place that I don't have to pay those fees. The beauty of Etsy is the SEO. It is the search engine and the built-in traffic of Etsy. So if you're not taking advantage of the audience that they're providing for you, there's no reason to pay those fees. So I think that that is the most important part really of, of being on Etsy is being able to take advantage of the built-in traffic that they have. All right. You have spoken to my soul. This <laughs> resonates with me greatly. Okay. This, that answers all my questions. That, <laughs> that just clears it all up. So yeah, the fees are fine. All of it's fine. I'm so glad I could help. Yes. But I mean, for the listeners too, cause I literally actually just had a live Q and a with my craft a career course and they were asking about Etsy. And I was like, mm-hmm. I don't understand. I'm having a podcast interview. It'll come up next week. Let's wait. But I was like, from what I understand, I, I don't get it. I get it now. Like, yeah. You don't have to do all of these things. I, I still think it's good to diversify and to have a website, but Etsy is a beautiful search engine where people can find you and you can just list it smartly and let it do its work. Right. And I, right? and I think that that is, like I said, that's kind of been a shift. Um, I think a lot of people start on Etsy, but then once they get... Etsy is very easy to get started on. Like the barriers to entry in terms of website design and all that kind of stuff is like pretty much non-existent. Like you just put your listings up there. It's really easy. But then they think that the ultimate goal is to get off of Etsy and only have your own website, like that you'll outgrow Etsy. And my argument to that would be like, you know, there are buyers that are loyal to Amazon. There are buyers that are loyal to Etsy. There are buyers that will come and buy on your own website and they're loyal to you. Why would you not try to get in front of the, the people that are loyal to that platform? I mean, I, I've had people that have come back to my shop 30 or 40 times and they come back to the Etsy shop. And then I have people who buy one time in the Etsy shop and I, you know, direct them to my own website through various mechanisms. And then they come back and they buy from my website in the future. So it really depends on the buyer. But if you don't have that presence on the platform, you're eliminating those people who are looking specifically on Etsy. All right. You're speaking my language. I get this. And now I'm like, well, all right, better go look at Etsy. (laughs) So (laughs) what, I mean, in a nutshell, obviously you have a a course or is it a course or a mentorship program? What is it that you offer exactly? I mean, I do like, it's a course. And then I do like, um, like troubleshooting, basically live Q and A's and that kind of stuff as well to offer support. So obviously that's where the full thing is. Can you share like a tip for listeners? If you're getting started, consider this, you know? (laughs) Yeah. So one of a, one kind of like, um, I don't want to call it a mistake because that seems negative, but a misstep, um, that I see people do a lot. The Etsy SEO is primarily the title and tags within the listing. And one thing that I see a lot of people who are just getting started do is to describe, like just describe the physical aspects of their product. You know, this is a 30 by 40 handmade quilt end. And what you really need to be thinking through in writing up your listings is who, you know, we've talked about this um, in our conversation, but who is buying it? Why are they buying it? What are they buying it for? Where is it going to go in their house? All of these kind of supportive questions that don't just describe the product because most of the time people might be looking for a specific product, but they're also looking for it 
for a reason. So whether it's as a gift or whether it's for a certain place in their house or whatever, there's a reason why they're buying something. Um, and so, you know, I will get some, uh, another kind of piece of that is the people who have like a very specific skill set. they will use some of those industry terms in the SEO. And again, like you need to be thinking about how the buyer searches for your product rather than how somebody who makes things similar to you would be using those words. So sometimes we, as creators or crafters, um, or artists, you know, we get so familiar with the kind of work that you do and the, the words that like, for instance, okay, I'll use my own shop for an example. I would make applique, um, burp cloths. That's where I started. I made applique burp cloth sets for babies. And I found that people would look for personalized burp cloths or monogrammed burp cloths, but they didn't necessarily know the word applique because people who make appliques know that word and people who are in the crafting space know that word. But somebody who's just looking for a cute little design doesn't necessarily know that that's the way that you make it. Okay. That's so smart. Well, yeah. And in my industry, again, coming in as a non-quilter, I was like, oh, I made a blanket and quilters like, oh, it is right. not a blanket. It is a quilt. And so, but you got to know that that's what people are going to be searching for. Is- and, and like people will have a list where they'll put like, um, you know, the pat, like whatever the pattern is, like the, um, the name of the pattern. Yeah. Like the name of the pattern or long arm quilting or something. And you're like, okay, but yep. the only people who's going to, who are going to know those terms are people who are making their own quilts and people who are making their own quilts probably aren't going to buy your finished quilt, you know? So yep. to think about who, who that final person is and, and yeah, they're buying, uh, uh, pink and gray baby blanket for a nursery. They're not buying a long arm quilted, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yep. With the name of the fabric listed in it and right. all that. Yeah, okay. they don't know those things. <laughs> Very interesting, which can be tricky for someone who's, you know, so inside the industry. How do you recommend to people search? I don't know. How would some, or is this for inside the course? <laughs> no, I mean, if you were just like wanting to get started on Etsy and you were saying, okay, I have this quilt that I've already made and I want to list it on Etsy. I would, well, first off, you could ask friends who don't make quilts and they will give you more basic terms, you know, hold this up. What, what mm-hmm. would they, they'd be like, oh, it's a farmhouse quilt. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. things like that. But then I would go on Etsy and see what kind of comparable products are there out there and how are those people describing them? Not to say that you should like copy and paste somebody else's title. Cause that's not cool, but right. Um, you know, how are, what kind of terms are people using? And most of the time you will find like they are using, um, sometimes they'll describe the material. Sometimes a lot of times they'll describe the style, the colors, those kinds of things. Um, and, and again, just really thinking about how somebody's utilizing the product, where, where are they using it? How are they using it? Is it a decoration or are they actually using it? Um, and using mm-hmm. some of those phrases and stuff in your SEO. Okay. And then from a business, like a business owner to business owner, if you were to draw a pie chart of your income, how much comes from where, where are your different revenue streams coming from? Within my shop or my business as a whole? As a whole. Yep. Um, I mean, I have the, my Etsy shop is completely different. So there's like not really any revenue overlap between my Etsy shop, which is just physical products, um, baby blankets and bunnies. Um, and then the coaching side of the business. So I would have to look at a pie chart. I (laughs) I don't know off the top of my head, um, how it has shifted back and forth over the years. Like it definitely, started where the vast majority of the income came from my shop as the coaching side of my business has grown, then it's shifted somewhat. Um, and so I have the course that I sell. I also do like some one-on-one coaching, um, that makes up a smaller percentage just for time constraints. Um, and then I have the Etsy shop, which is separate. So I don't, I don't know. I would have to look at my spreadsheet there. I, I keep them like completely separate. So I've never looked at it like as a whole business. And then what percentage each makes up. Cause I like to look at like 
my Etsy shop or my, well, I have my own website as well. So like the physical product side of the business expenses and income, and then the coaching side income and expenses and have them separate. So I know how profitable each one is. Cause obviously with physical prop, um, products, those profit margins are different than with digital products. Right. And which two things, one, I'm curious, just so I don't forget, uh, your website and Etsy, which one generally sells more? Um, Etsy, my Etsy shop okay. is busier than my own website. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. To be fair, I haven't put a whole lot of effort into my own website. I am kind of okay. at a point where like, I don't necessarily want to continue to grow that business. I'm pretty happy with, um, Mm -hmm. where I am with that and the amount of time that it takes me. So like, I, I am kind of at this point where I feel like I have this well-oiled machine and I don't necessarily want to grow it bigger. It's really streamlined. It's really pretty profitable. And like, so I'm good to go with that. (laughs) I like that. I like that disclaimer and that you can get to that point where everyone gets to decide, or hopefully you get to that point where you can decide, do I want to really grow this more or am I happy with where it is right now? Yeah. And there was, there were a lot of years where I was like, I want, you know, 20% growth every single year, like as I was building the business. But then I kind of got to a point where I was like, you know what, this is doing for me what I want it to do. It's bringing in the income that I want it to bring in. And, and I don't really want to work more hours in this business. Um, I don't, I mean, my monograms are extremely repetitive, so I like doing it, um, to a, to a, point. And then I don't want to do it all day, every single day. (laughs) Yep. And I love too, that you have diversified because, and you stayed within your niche, you have diversified your income streams, but stayed very narrow and, Mm -hmm. and that's been successful. And that's, that lights me up. That always gets me excited. So for the listeners who are listening, this is a wonderful example, a case study, if you will, of someone who has niched down and then expanded within the niche. Yeah. So if you had one piece of advice for a starting entrepreneur, what would that be? I would say that honestly, the biggest piece of advice that I would say to somebody is to know that that opportunity is out there. It is completely achievable and it's not going to happen overnight. Um, and I think that if you know those things, it gets you through the ups and downs. Um, and it allows you to feel like every step that you're taking or every new thing that you're learning or whatever is getting you to that point that you want to be at. But I I have, (laughs) I have seen some very, very fast success stories. I have some students who like made six figures their first year of selling, that was not my journey. Um, and honestly, I'm not sure that I would have wanted it to be my journey just because of the season of life that I was in at the time that I started, but it didn't mean that I didn't get there. Um, and I think that the impatience of people is a lot of times what ends up being the breaking point for them. They, they want it to happen so quickly that they get frustrated really, really fast when it doesn't happen really quickly. That is beautifully said. And oftentimes I see the people who are consistent, the slow and steady win the race, you know, that they stick around. And just by being consistent and sticking around, you will beat out, I don't know what percentage I'm going to say over half of the people who Mm -hmm. enter the market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. I agree. And I, and I think like, you know, if, and and I look back on my own story, you know, like it took me five years. I started in 2012 And I hit six figures for the first time in 2017. Um, Not not because it couldn't have happened faster. And certainly I think now it can happen, you know, a lot faster than that. (laughs) I would not tell people it's going to take me five years to get um, to six figures. But when I really decided to do, I mean, I can remember, remember when my second child was very young saying, I would really like to be able to turn this into a full-time income by the time she starts kindergarten. And she was like one at the time, you know? So like that was such a long-term vision for me and it happened faster than that. Um, but, but it wasn't, 
if it hadn't happened faster than that, that was where I was setting my standard was like, you know, in the next five years, I want to be able to make this a full-time income. So if it didn't happen in a year or two years, I wasn't going to be disappointed by that. And, and again, yeah. like not to say that people should set their expectations really low um, <laughs> because that's not necessarily the goal. And certainly I think that that can happen much, much faster than it did for me. I have four kids. So there was like a lot of baby years for me. Um, where that was not my main focus. Um, but you know, just that, that kind of grit to, to stick with it and say, like, I know that I can do this. And I know that not only that I can do it, but like that, that possibility is out there and that the, the differentiator between the people who are doing it and who are not doing it a lot of times is just sticking with it. Exactly. And I do see a few people who've been in the industry for so long and they have hit a point, I don't know what you call a plateau and they're having a hard time breaking that plateau. And from my, there could be so many reasons for this, but sometimes I feel like it comes to a mindset shift. I mean, for you, how did, because I hear you say you had that, if I don't make it at this point, then I'm out. Whereas for me, I've approached it as, oh, I will get to that. Thing, you know, so how did you, with that mindset of maybe I won't make it, how did you have that grit and that determination with leaving yourself an out, you know? I don't know that I really had a, a, an out so much as I just didn't really have a, a limit for where I, I didn't say like, this has to be, you know, a hundred thousand dollar business by X point or any, like I just had, I almost had like very few expectations for myself, which is like completely counter to my personality. So I don't really know. (laughs) Um, but I kind of just like stumbled into it and then it just, I just kind of allowed it to do its thing for a little while. And I didn't necessarily try to push it farther. You also have to understand that in this season of my life, my husband was gone all the time. Like, I mean, literally he was gone, (laughs) but also Mm -hmm. like, even when he was home, he left at like four o'clock in the morning and got home at like eight o'clock at night. So, and we lived not anywhere near family. And, and so there was a lot of resistance from that, which is a whole different conversation, but a lot of resistance from him, um, in terms of my ability to grow a business at that stage in my life. Like he was not going to be supportive of me, like working full time in this business. It had to stay sort of the side hustle for a period of time until our lives changed a little bit. So I do think that, you know, if I, if I looked back on my Etsy stats, my first year in business, I made like $1,200. And then my next year in business, I made like $15,000. And, and all along the way, like as this grew and, um, you know, I took like six months off when I had babies and like, I just kind of didn't, I did not ever look at it as like, I'm not, I'm failing because I'm not continuing to grow or I'm failing because I'm having a baby. And so I can't, focus on this right now. I don't want to focus on this right now. I always kind of just looked at it as a choice. I think like if it's a side hustle, it's because that's what I want it to be right now. Um, and if I take six months off because I have a baby, I want it, you know, that's my choice. Like I took six months off. Actually, it was a little more than six months when I had my third baby and I didn't take any time off when I had my fourth baby. So, you know, that changed in my, my season of life too. I will also say that I function really well in chaos. <laughs> so that could also be part of my just personality is that I like have to be super busy all the time. Um, but I never looked at it in those stages as not achieving my goals because these other things were holding me back. It was just more like, this is where I am right now. And someday it will be different. You know, I won't always have all these kids at home, not in school. Like now my oldest is 10 and a half. So like a lot of things have changed in those seasons of life. Um, and I don't know, this is probably like a very rose colored glasses version of it, because I'm sure that there were times that as, you know, as we went through this process that I was very frustrated, but looking back on it now, I'm glad that it, 
allowed it. I think if I would have pushed harder in those earlier stages, um, that it probably would have not worked for our lifestyle at the time. Like anybody that is in the military kind of knows that like the military comes first. You, you can't have competing priorities. The military is the number one priority. (laughs) Wow. Well, and I do love, there is like a really nice gift that we have as human beings where we forget the painful things, you know, like looking back, it's like, no, this has been a really great journey. And if you pull out like a journal entry or if you had a video camera out, you'd be like, oh, that was really hard. Oh my gosh. You know, but it's, you know. And I don't know, honestly, like when I look back on it, I say like, what was the vision for that person? Like, because there were times while he was in Afghanistan that like, I would put the kids to bed and I would work for like, you know, four, five, six hours at night, like into the night, midnight, one o'clock in the morning, whatever. And then I would get up again at six o'clock in the morning and do it all over. It was like groundhog day. Um, and so I look at that and I say like, what was I hoping to achieve? Like, what was my goal (laughs) there? Because I don't remember having like really specific goals, but, but there had to have been something that was driving me to do that. Otherwise I wouldn't have been doing it. (laughs) Right. You know, and people have asked me along the way, what, what drives you? I still to this day cannot pinpoint it. Like, I don't know. So that's a very interesting question. You know, like what, what is that fire? Why, why do I have this drive? And anyhow, that's an interesting I think it's the topic challenge there. for me a lot of times. Like it's, you know, like I can remember my mom talking about kind of the, the revenue, you know, this is like, everybody's all surprised my family and whatever, when this business actually was like profitable, <laughs> like, cause this was just mm-hmm, a cute yeah. little thing that I was doing for a long time. Um, And my mom was like, I just can't even believe that, you know, you've had whatever amount of sales on Etsy. And I was like, you know, for me, it never really was. And this is like an enormous amount of privilege, I think, in in having my husband have a job that was, you know, I I came at from this as a stay at home mom. So we weren't depending on that income when I was getting started. But um, to say that, that it it never really was about the money for me. It was always kind of about the challenge to succeed. And I think that that really was what was driving me more than anything was not so much. And, and especially because, you know, as I said before, my sister-in-law already had a very successful Etsy shop. And so I saw the possibility firsthand, like there wasn't this ambiguous, uh, you know, you can be successful to me. Like I saw it living in her. Um, and so to be able to say like, well, if she can do it, I can do it. (laughs) Right. Uh, right. And then to not give up because like, well, I'm not going to tell myself if she can do it, I can do it and then fail. Like that, that's not, I am two Enneagram three for that. So, right. (laughs) (laughs) Do you know, I didn't, well, and people will say like, oh, you must be pretty competitive. I'm like, no, but step back. I guess I am. I wonder if this is, that's something I'm kind of curious now, if most entrepreneurs can relate to that. You know, I'm curious about that. Well, I would never say I'm not competitive. I I was like a cutthroat athlete my whole childhood. Oh, really? Okay. What sports did you play or sports? I swam. Oh, very cool. Well, we'll have to meet in real life one day. I think you're pretty cool and I enjoy chatting with you. So (laughs) yeah, well, thank you so much for being here. For our listeners who want to learn more or tap into your brain on the Etsy SEO and success, where can they find you? Yeah, um, the best place would be uh, my website is laurenkeplinger.com and my Instagram is lauren.keplinger which I'm mostly on Instagram for social media. And then my podcast um, is Crickets Chichichings. Which is super clever. I love that. And can you spell your last name? I know I, I pronounced it wrong at first, but it's, if people are like, wait, how do you spell that? Literally everybody pronounces it Keplinger except for us. I'm pretty sure we pronounce okay. it wrong. <laughs> um, it is K-E-P-L-I-N-G-E-R. And Lauren is spelled normally. Okay, perfect. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here. This was just a pleasure. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. Lauren, thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast. It was, as I mentioned at the beginning, super insightful for me, and I actually did change my view on Etsy. I do feel like there is a place and that you can find success 
And it's just, it's a very different approach from marketing that I have taken, but there's a place for that. And as I mentioned before, Lauren shares her view on Etsy and gives courses on it even. But even if you just go follow her on Instagram, you will learn a lot about her business advice, especially in regards to Etsy. So thank you so much for being here. Tune in next week on the Crafty Career Podcast. I am very excited about next week's episode. I had the chance to travel with a few friends, quilting business friends, and we're just going to do a conversation together, chatting about business and all of the things. So come and meet my friends next week and join us as we chat about business and friendship and quilting. And we'll see you next Friday. If you are enjoying the podcast, go ahead and leave a review. It really is helpful for the success of the podcast. It helps the podcast to be shared more and to be found more. And it really helps me know that these podcast interviews are resonating and that they're helping you creative entrepreneurs out there. So go ahead and leave a review and write a comment. Let me know what is helpful with this podcast. And if there's a topic you want to hear about, send me a DM. I prefer that over emails. My inbox is a little bit crazy, but send me a DM and Instagram and I take note. I literally have a note on my phone, a note page where I write down the topics that people want to hear about. So send me a DM. Let me know if there's a topic you want to hear about and I will see you next Friday. Until then, have a wonderful week. Mm -hmm.